thank you very much for coming uh, this afternoon to Is Socialism Making a Comeback? Um, we'll have the same standard format as we've had in other debates, so each of the speakers will speak, uh, and then we're probably pretty eager to go out onto the floor and hear your views about this topic. So broadly, since the 2008 uh, economic crisis, certainly in the West, ideas of socialism and allegedly socialist candidates have been rising in popularity. And I think what we want to explore here is, is that meaningful? Is socialism making a comeback? Is it a form of just re-establishing social democracy? Um, furthermore, there's been a lot of books published recently about fully automated luxury communism and sort of techno-socialism. That's something to explore as well. Uh, around the world, um, there are other countries that are, are sort of holding out having a socialist model like Cuba, Venezuela, whether these countries are socialist will remain socialist and whether they are successes or failures is all up for debate today. So I'm just going to introduce our panel in the order that they speak uh, and then we'll kick off uh, the debate. So um, on my far left, uh, speaking first, is uh, Douglas Lane, who is the publishing manager at Zero Books, a novelist, uh, and his novel is Bash Bash Revolution, and he is a podcaster and YouTuber. And speaking second uh, to my social democratic left <laughs> um, is Kate Andrews, who is, the, is an associate director at the Institute of Economic Affairs and a columnist at City AM. Speaking third is um, Dr. Albena Asmanova, um, who is the professor of political theory at the University of Kent and the Brussels Schools of International Studies and the author of Capitalism on Edge. Speaking fourth is uh, Daniel Benamy, who is a journalist and author. His book, Ferraris for All, In Defense of Economic Progress, and also the book, Cowardly Capitalism. And then finally, um, on my far right, but I don't think politically you're, you're, you're of that bent, um, will be uh, Johnny Ball, who is the special projects writer at The New Statesman. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to speak on the panel. Uh, and without further ado, uh, Douglas, could you take us away, please? Sure. So the question is, um, is socialism having a comeback? And uh, the first thing I would say to that is that it, it, it's never gone away. And that's because socialism is a symptom or the idea of socialism or the struggle for socialism is a symptom of the development of capitalism, that you can't really uh, disentangle the two. Uh, socialism is a dream of realizing the promises that bourgeois democratic liberal modernity makes. And the, the main problem that, uh, that liberal modernity offers us is the problem of freedom. What we're aiming to achieve isn't state power, it isn't even redistribution, but it's self-responsibility and self-control, both as an individuals and collectively. So that's the, what socialism is. Is it having a comeback? Well, it's, it's interesting to reframe that, that question because it's never gone away and it's always coming back in new guises. When I was younger and first getting involved in socialism, I was an anarchist. I was in the Pacific Northwest and I would never have gotten involved with anything Marxist or communist um, because having grown up in the Cold War under Reagan, I understood that um, communism was authoritarian and uh, oppressive. Uh, but I liked socialism and I liked the idea of anarchism and being self-directed and, and in control of society as an individual. Um, and I, was, I stayed a, some sort of anarchist for a long time until my 30s, until the economic crisis came along. And at that time, my own vision for socialism altered. Uh, I think it happened not just for me though, it, it altered across uh, the left in the face of an economic crisis. So what's ha what happens is as politics changes and as crises of various types, whether they're, it's economic or social or political come along, the vision of what socialism is changes as well. And after 2008, Marx came back and I actually read him for the first time. I started podcasting. And I think that Marx is still a dominant figure for the left today perhaps not for our practical politics yet. You asked if what we were looking at was a revival, revival of socialism or social democracy. I don't think there's any question that what's on offer in the West are social democratic candidates. 
and not socialist ones. But we have to be clear that um, from one perspective, uh, from my perspective, a Marxist one, we've never actually achieved socialism because socialism would re would require the state to wither away. The socialism socialism would require the working class to abolish itself. It would require a very, very different kind of economic and political and social order. So we haven't seen that. And I know that uh, Jordan Peterson is out there uh, mocking me for saying, you know, well, that's not real Marxism or that's not real socialism. But what I would say is that when you think about socialism, you have to think about it in the negative because all we've got is, is if you're a Marxist, uh, is some understanding of what we don't want. We don't want the wage relationship. We don't want the state. Um, and ultimately, we don't want commodity production. We want things, useful things, to be produced en masse, but we don't want them to be produced on the basis of the value of labor. Um, in other words, the amount of uh, value in, a, in the commodity being measured and the amount of time it took for a working person to create it. Uh, so those are... Um, those are the things we want to get rid of, and we don't quite have a vision for what we want to put in this place. Uh, but at the start, I said that socialism was about achieving freedom, and I think that the best way to understand freedom uh, might not come from Marx, but comes from uh, Sylvie Zizek. Uh, he tells a joke over and over again about a man who um, was in a psychiatric hospital because he thought he was a grain of corn and, and the chicken was going to eat him. And the psychiatrist uh, worked with him uh, for a long time, got him to realize he was a human being. And they, one day after many months, they let him go. And uh, he you know, walked out into the courtyard and immediately turned around and came back again. And they asked him, why, why are you back? And he said, well, there was a chicken out there in the courtyard. And he says, well, why is that a problem? You're not a grain of corn. You know you're a man. And he says, yes, I know, but does the chicken know? Um, so what we need is another chicken, as Zizek would say, uh, which means we need uh, something, some new mediating force that we don't even have to quite believe in uh, for it to organize our lives. But we have to be aware that it's our own creation. And I think uh, that's what, what we should be striving for. Um, nonetheless, uh, the social democratic candidates that we have are at least to turn away from neoliberalism and the idea that the market forces and the forms of production that we have now are natural. Uh, so when you have someone like Jeremy Corbyn or Bernie Sanders making the promise to intervene on the path of regular people uh, against what seem like natural forces after 30, 40 years of neoliberalism, it's a positive small step forward towards true socialism. Well, thank you very much. and. Uh... And uh, Kate. Thank you. Um, well, Douglas and I are going to agree on our first sentence, but I think we're going to diverge from there. Um, socialism isn't making a comeback because it is always with us. I agree on that. Um, it has been uh, a minority but very powerful group of usually intellectual elites that keep this idea alive, that patch pass the torch from person to person flagging up country to country that is supposed to be the new great socialist experiment and then when it ends in misery and disaster and death which it always does um they find the new country to move on to thankfully the majority of people mostly around the world um, are fairly reasonable when it comes to election times or referendums and recognize that the fantasy ideas being put on offer really come from some kind of utopia that doesn't exist and, and reject it almost in full but unfortunately it's not always the case um, but, you know, the voices are strong enough, they're intellectual enough, and they're usually high status enough, the Noam Chomsky's of the world, uh, the Jeremy Corbyn's and Bernie Sanders of the world, uh, that they are able to keep the ideas alive. And I mean, they're so deluded sometimes that it, it's amazing what actually comes out of their mouths. Bernie Sanders talking about how when you see countries with bread lines historically, that's a good thing because they're taking care of their own. Um, you know, things that I just actually don't think resonate with most people, but there's always a new socialist experiment that we're supposed to get excited about. Um, 
And it's not just Jordan Peterson who I think takes issue with it. I mean, it's people across the board. My colleague at the IEA, Dr. Christian Niemitz, um, wrote last year um, his big book, Socialism, The Failed Idea That Never Dies. And he came up with the three-step process for socialists, which rings true with every experiment. First, it's the honeymoon phase. There's some new country on the horizon, China, Chile, Venezuela, and the intellectuals get very excited about it. And nobody at that point doubts that it's real socialism. You know, this is the future. Then you move in to the next phase because all honeymoons have to die. And when things start going wrong, you still get murmurs from the true intellectuals that maybe it's all right. Um, but people start to step away from it. And then you move into the final stage that that wasn't real socialism stage. And people claim they never said that was real socialism because somehow, even in its purest form, capitalism still seemed to creep in there and ruin the whole thing. And I mean, let's look at the most recent example with Venezuela. So you had the likes of Owen Jones saying Venezuela is an inspiration to the world shows there's an alternative. You've got Unite the Union's Len McCluskey saying Europe might want to learn the obvious lessons from Venezuela. Please tell me what those obvious lessons are. Uh, you've got uh, Corbyn saying Chavez showed us there is another, a different and a better way of doing things. It's called socialism. Noam Chomsky said, what's so exciting is that I have seen a better world that's being created, the transformation in Venezuela, um, taking us to another socioeconomic model that could have a global impact. Well, what does Noam Chomsky say about that now? That was roughly 2009. Now he says, I never describe Chavez state capitalist government as socialism, or even hinted at such an absurdity. They will, I think one of the biggest issues we have around socialism is that its biggest advocates who want to believe in this utopia will never take credit for it because there's nothing to take credit for. The philosophy just takes many, many lives. And we've seen what's happened in Venezuela, the latest socialist experiment to no longer be socialist. 90% of Venezuelans live below the poverty line. More than 4 million have fled the country. That makes it comparable to the Syrian refugee crisis, to put it in perspective. Uh, the monthly income in Venezuela on average now is $8. This is the most oil rich country in the world. Um, there's nothing that is possibly so damaging in terms of philosophies as that of socialism. Um, so is it making a comeback? Well, no, not really. We're going through the same phase as we've always gone through. Although I think you can make the argument that, um, especially uh, in the UK and the USA, more politicians are, are claiming this word. But I think we always have to remember what socialism really is. Douglas and others on the left can claim that the word changes and the meaning changes, but it really, really doesn't. Um, socialism is uh, the economic theory that puts the production, the distribution, the exchange back in the hands of the community. And the only way to achieve that on the way to communism is to do it through force. Because it turns out people actually don't like giving up their private property, they don't like giving up their freedoms, they don't like giving up their autonomy, and they don't like some top-down structure that tells them what to do all the time. Douglas says you can't separate socialism from capitalism because it's theoretically the next stage. Theoretically is the key word there because it's never been successful. But what is certain is that you can't get to the utopia of communism where everything falls away without that step of socialism. And it always requires force. It always requires lives to be taken. And you can't just lump it in with social democracy either because if what the socialists are really telling me is that they really just want to look like Scandinavia, they want to look like Sweden and Finland, and they'd love to have free market capitalist countries that respect private property and the rule of law with a bit more tax and redistribution, I'm very, very happy to have that debate. Let's debate tax margins. Let's not debate a philosophy that has claimed tens of millions of lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. And uh, now, Albena. The idea of socialism is back, but that is not necessarily bad news for capitalism. Um, I grew up under the dicta socialist dictatorships in my native Bulgaria, and uh, as we were fighting that oppression that had hijacked the name socialism for itself, and we were fighting for some form of a more liberal, more fair uh, uh, socialism. So at that time, we were joking that socialism is the longest and most tedious, uh, most difficult road from capitalism to capitalism. 
that socialist dictatorship discredited the idea of socialism. It, it looked like it was the, the, the death sentence of socialism. And yet now we have the millennial socialists, or socialist millennials. Um, it is a very hopeful phenomenon. And yet I, I'm afraid, and I speak as a person who believe in a form of liberal socialism. I believe, I'm afraid that the, the form under which socialism is coming back is the wrong one. And it is doing damage to the radical struggles against capitalism. So it's becoming an obstacle for the fight against capitalism. Now, let me, let me explain what I mean. So the way socialism is coming back into fashion, it's, it's through a critique of inequality. So equality is the, the, the main uh, idea of justice. Um, we have the Socialist Party uh, of, uh, in the European Parliament that adopted uh, this manifesto for equal society last year. So equality is center stage. And uh, uh, we have recovered some sort of idea of class struggle, tax the rich, the rich are the enemy. Well, this is the most crude idea of socialism you can have. It is past its time and it is doing damage. It is short-sighted because imagine with me a society where all the workers own their factories, they're paid the same, so equal, inclusive societies, but they're still pursuing in a competitive manner with the likes of China, you know, they're, they're, they're chasing profits. And that chase for profits is destroying the environment, human lives and communities. So we could have societies without private property, full equality and still uh, practicing uh, the, 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 the main logic of, of capitalism, the competitive pursuit of profit. So this is what we need to be careful about. So the, the, the current, the, the revival of socialism is facing what I like to call the trap of the paradox of emancipation. As we're fighting for equality and inclusion, we forget to question the model of life within which we want equality and inclusion. Um, the good news, there's a piece of good news, however, that we live in a very special historical moment where the haves and have nots for the first time have a very strong, uh, de have developed a dislike of capitalism. Um, they have a, a bone to pick with capitalism. Why? Because in the past 30 years, the neoliberal capitalism created such competitive pressures that are destroying um, basically the, the, the lives of the 99%. Neoliberal capitalism created not a precarious class, it created a precarious multitude. So we, the, uh, this precarity is taking many forms for the, for the, the, the poor and, and the overworked. Uh, they take one form um, for, uh, for, for the rich and overworked, they take another form. So uh, stress, mental health, uh, problems, uh, work, uh, life, uh, uh, poor balance. Uh, those who cannot, uh, who, who, who cannot stop working uh, are blocking the access to the labor market of those who, uh, who don't even have a chance to take a job. So the, the competitive pressures of capitalism are destroying even the lives of the uh, insiders that we so envy, the rich and well uh, trained and well remunerated. So we need to take advantage of that, of, of that uh, historical opening of a broad anti-capitalist uh, coalition uh, that can be mobilized against this massive precariousness. But I'm afraid that the particular revival of socialism can be in the way of that. It can be in the way of that exactly because socialism is, uh, has, a require, uh, has acquired this negative connotation uh, uh, during the Cold War. Uh, so it is might be scaring exactly those people who might want to oppose capitalism. Uh, so in my last book, I um, argue that we can mobilize against capitalism, a movement against capitalism without the reliance or without reliance on utopias, without uh, even having a, a great crisis of capitalism and certainly without a revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albana. And now, um, Johnny. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, 
is socialism making a comeback? Basically, well, it's difficult to define what socialism is. As you've already heard, if you ask two different people what socialism is, they'll give you two different answers, or hundreds, they'll give you a hundred different answers. To me, it's summed up um, quite clearly in the phrase, uh, socialism is about securing for the workers by hand um, or by brain the full fruits of their industry on the basis of the common distribution, uh, the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. I think I've got that right. I don't know. <laughs> Basically, clause four of the Labour Party. OK, um, and the Labour Party conference recently, the delegates voted in favour of uh, in back clause four. Um, which commits the Labour Party to common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. It was blocked by the unions, the union bloc votes at conference. Um, the idea of the grassroots of the Labour Party uh, voting through Clause 4, again, it was abolished in 1994, um, would have been unthinkable just a few years ago under Blair, Brown and even Miliband. Does that mean socialism is making a comeback? Well, it's certainly not the socialism of the 70s. Um, and the sort of trade union left and the working class left, and it's not the socialism of 1917. But there is definitely a break in the idea that the market is always right, that um, the, the, the basically the private sector can always operate more efficiently than the public sector, the, the state should be small, that taxes and regulations should be low in order to attract <coughs> private investment. Is this socialism? No, probably not. Disagreeing with those things does not mean you're a socialist. We've heard the phrase social democracy. Maybe you could call it that. But again, it's not 70s social democracy. I think there's something different because we're seeing the rise of the sort of online millennial left, you said, or the Twitter left, the, the sort of meme producing left. People like um, Ash Sarkar, Navarra Media, that kind of thing. And she has on her Twitter bio, uh, Anarcho Fabulous. Um, she's a Corbyn supporter. She calls herself Anarcho Fabulous. You've seen the... the the return of sort of ideas about social movements and sort of horizontal organizing. Douglas said he was an anarchist when he was younger. I was the same. But the thing that turns me against uh, anarchism was actually going to a few anarchist meetings. My God, it's the most painful thing in the world. You know, the, too, too many cooks um, and too, too much of this, you know. And, and, and this idea that everyone wants to sort of, um, you know, after they finish their day work, they all want to go to a neighborhood assembly and discuss who's going to sweep the streets and who's going to collect the rubbish. And, you know, they all want to manage their industries. You don't want to do that. You just want the government to sort it out for you, you know, deliver services properly. Well, that's what I'd prefer. Anyway, that's how I want to spend my evenings. But, um, yeah, as I said, it's not necessarily socialism, but neoliberalism has took a massive, massive hit since 2008. And actually, it's, it's taken a hit on the right. Um, it isn't just Corbyn and Sanders and... Melanchon in France or Podemos in Spain or Syriza in Greece. I know Syriza capitulated and lost the last election, but that's another story. But on the right, you're seeing um, uh, a rejection of traditional free market Thatcherite um, sort of monetarist or, you know, Austrian school economic, blah, blah, blah. They're far more in favor of interventionist states. Um, Theresa May sort of went to a more sort of communitarian, one nation, conservative type of thing. Um, Boris Johnson sort of abandoned austerity. He's sort of this boosterism, they call it. You know, he's just throwing money around, almost like a sort of reactionary Keynesian, you know. Um, and you have Le Pen, who's taken votes off the old Communist Party in France, just with added racism. Um, but it's, it's, it's all about state intervention. You're seeing the return of the state um, and the, the return of the state's role uh, in the economy, even with Trump. I mean, I know Trump delivered a load of corporate tax cuts. But, you know, the idea that he's a tr traditional free market Republican is, is, is nonsense. You know, the tariffs he's placing on things uh, and the rhetoric he used against Hillary Clinton about, you know, he, he really sort of painted himself as the, as the blue collar candidate, whereas Hillary Clinton was, uh, you know, the candidate of the elite. Um, Kate, Kate, actually, I wanted, to, I wanted to take issue with something Kate said. Kate said that it was a movement pr uh, predominantly of, of, of intellectuals and people like Noam Chomsky. Um, I mean, that's certainly true. It does have its leading intellectual lights, undoubtedly. Um, but I saw a graph the other day, and I actually wish you could all see it right now. <laughs> but it basically, it split the 650 UK constituencies um, into the order of deprivation based on multiple indices of deprivation, uh, unemployment, average income, blah, blah, blah. And it colored those constituencies, red, blue, 
uh, yellow green according to you know who they voted for and of course the further towards deprivation you go the far higher concentration of red constituencies i mean people say that voter loyalty and people don't vote on class anymore i mean i don't think that's true, true at all that the most deprived constituency in the country is walton liverpool walton um, that that delivered a uh, Bashar al-Assad style majority for Labour last time. Eighty-five percent of the vote the Labour Party got. This is Corbyn's Labour Party. You know the people of Liverpool Walton aren't going. Oh, they see. Oh, you know they're not Islington lefty vegetarian socialists. These are you know these these are working class people who've been completely let down by uh, by Westminster by the whole social economic model that we've been following for the last forty years. Basically, yeah, the two thousand and eight crisis is has really undermined neoliberalism. And uh, we are seeing a return of, of movements which uh, go against, thank you, that go against, that go against the last sort of 40 years of economic orthodoxy, whether that's socialism, I'm not sure. Apologies for saying this quote, because I'm sure you've read it about a million times of, since 2008, but you know, the, it, everyone keeps going, Gramsci, 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 you know. <laughs> Basically, you know, the old, the old order has died and the new one is yet to begin. And he says in this, in this interregnum, uh, a whole load of morbid symptoms appear, and depending on your point of view, the morbid system, the morbid symptom might be Corbyn or it might be Trump. To me, it's more Trump. But <laughs> I think there's definitely we're definitely at the on the cusp of a sort of new uh, paradigm, um, in the same way that we were in 1945 and 1979. Whether you can call that socialism, I don't know, but it's definitely not sort of neoliberal free market capitalism. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Johnny. And now Daniel. Thanks, Robert. Uh, well, I think socialism is dead. I mean, whether you think it's a, a good thing, uh, socialism is a good thing, like Douglas, you're critical, like Kate. I think really to have a proper discussion of politics today, we've got to come to terms with the fact that socialism is dead. Socialism is not making a comeback. It's, it's gone. Now, that, of course, begs the question, because you do have something that looks like socialism, sounds like socialism, often uses the rhetoric, apparently, of socialism. But I think if you begin to examine it more closely, you'll see that it's very different from what existed historically as socialism. And I should add the caveat that, of course, I'm, I'm generalising. There have been very di many different socialist movements in the past. But I want to talk in broad terms about uh, what my argument entails, talk about Britain, although we can talk in the discussion about the historical example, but really to make my case that what exists today sounds like socialism, whether you like it or not, but it is not socialism. So maybe the place to start probably is that a key idea of socialism historically was that it believed in working class agency. There was at least some notion that the working class would play a key role in running society. And yeah, there were more conservative versions of that idea. There were more radical versions of that idea. But working class agency was absolutely central to the idea of socialism. What you have now is completely antithetical to that. I mean, those people who call themselves socialists, and there are quite a lot of them, what they really believe in is technocracy. In other words, the rule by experts, the rule, rule for efficiency by people who understand the processes and who are experts, completely antithetical to the idea of working class agency. Now, it does sound a bit like socialism sometimes. So, for example, the Labour Party will say, for the many, not the few. And you might make the mistake of thinking, oh, for the many, yeah, they're talking about working class, working class control. But they're not, because when they talk about ordinary people, they, they see them as victims. That's why they're always talking about the vulnerable and the food banks, you know, from the perspective of modern socialists, uh, in inverted commas, the working class are pathetic victims who have to be helped by the great technical experts who run society in an efficient kind of way. Or they might bash the rich or the billionaires and the greedy bankers. And you can make the mistake. You can think, oh, of course, yeah, I recognize they're attacking the rich. That, that's socialism. Isn't that what socialism's about? But you listen carefully to what they're saying. And they're not saying, we don't like the billionaires because we want the working class to take control of society. They're saying, we don't, they're saying, we don't like the billionaires because we, the technocrats, the clever organizers, the people who run society in an efficient way, we can run society better. So it's a kind of technocratic critique of society. It's not about working class control or working class agency, completely antithetical to what socialism meant historically. Very closely related to that uh, is the European Union, because the left historically, generally speaking, was hostile 
to the European Union. It saw quite rightly that the European Union and its predecessors, it was a kind of technocratic organisation. Again, it was about the rule of experts, running things efficient, efficiently, not really having big ideas uh, and how things are run. So if you left-wing people like Tony Benn, uh, Eric Heffer, if anyone remembers him, you know, those kind of left-wing radicals, historically, there was a very strong trend in, in the British Labour Party, for example, against uh, the European Union and its predecessor organisations. Now, generally speaking, they love the European Union. They're ardent fans of this kind of technocratic monstrosity that is the European Union. And Jeremy Corbyn, in fact, sums up this kind of uh, technocratic worldview because he started as an old-style socialist. He, knew, he started as a kind of sidekick to Tony Benn uh, as an, and as a critic of the European Union. But he's given up on that now. And de facto, whatever he believes in his heart, he's a de facto a supporter of the European Union. So he's gone from the kind of old style socialism of working class agency to this monstrous technocracy that is the European Union. Uh, another example which I've been alluded to, equality and inequality. And people hear uh, the critique of inequality in billionaires uh, from the Labour Party, and they think, oh, yeah, I recognise that. That's, of course, that's socialism. Because didn't socialists always talk about equality? Didn't socialists criti uh, criticise inequality? But you listen more carefully to the, dis the discussion at the moment. If you think criticising inequality makes you a socialist, then the International Monetary Fund now is a, so is a socialist organisation because it's always criticising inequality, or to be more precise, extreme inequality. Davos, you know, the World Economic Forum in Davos, where all these plutocrats go in their private jets, discuss how terrible climate change is, how terrible extreme inequality is. They're also socialists by that definition, because they're also uh, criticising inequality. But what's really being said in, with this critique of inequality is not that working class living standards should rise, which historically was what socialism is about. It's about we should all make more sacrifices. We should make do with less so again, directly contrary to what socialism meant historically. I've got several other points, but I can make them in the discussion, hopefully. Okay. So. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, <laughs> eager to get out into the audience um, pretty shortly, but I just wanted to ask the panel if they wanted to come back on any particular points uh, that were made possibly in reference to them or a point of order um, before we go out to the uh, audience, because you may want to say something uh, that will get lost as the dis discussion progresses. I guess I feel like I want to say something to every single person on this <laughs> panel, and like we should all go out to a pub afterwards mm. and then see who lives. Um, <laughs> but I, I, Kate, I just want to point out to you that um, two things. I didn't say that the reason that socialism and capitalism are intertwined is because socialism naturally or obviously or has to follow after capitalism. Or the socialism doesn't necessarily come after capitalism. It came up with capitalism. Visions of socialist alternatives came up at the same time. And they, socialism was born out of the Enlightenment, just like liberal bourgeois politics were born out of the Enlightenment. That's what I meant to say. So I just wanted to correct that. Um, also, I would just point out that capitalism has its own body count. Um, that's one of the reasons I turned away from you know, mainstream politics was, was because of the threat of nuclear annihilation. I, I lived under uh, when I was, you know, growing up in the 80s. I, I live under it now, but I've forgotten about it um, most mm -hmm. of the time. And, um, and uh, what real socialism is, uh, is something that we have to work out, to, you know, collectively and through intellectual battles and action. Uh, it's, it's not something that has, it's ready made for us. So that's all. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I, I guess to that point, but also a few other things from the panel, there, there is this attitude when speaking about socialism that obviously capitalism is, is evil and has failed in some way. So, you know, what is the next step? What is what is the alternative? It, it was said that, you know, capitalism is destroying lives of 99% of us. I mean, what? what where? 
where has that come from? I mean, as we have seen countries like China and India move towards free market capitalism, we have seen such a sharp drop and a staggering drop China in absolute. In, no, no, no. As, as, as it has moved, as, as the authoritarian dictatorship, which was rooted in socialism and moved towards communism as it killed millions of people, has liberalized its economy, not really its attitude towards general human rights, but liberalized its economy. And also in India, we have seen, as people have had the opportunity to trade and to move goods and services across from each other and across borders, that the that the drop in absolute poverty has been truly significant. And when I hear people on the panel say things like socialism's got a bad name for itself because of the Cold War, because of the Soviet Union, I mean, that bad name for itself was made by the conservative estimate about 25 million people dying and a bigger estimate about 100 million people dying. So, so when we just look at the facts and figures, it's perfectly fine to take criticism, to criticize capitalism and free markets. I mean, we should, but um, by, by no means is the market perfect. The point is that at least people have choice within the market. And nobody has been able to yet point out one socialist example anywhere in the past hundred years where people have ch had choice over their authorian dictatorship, which has taken away their property, taken away their rights, and forced them to live in a way that they chose not to. Thank you. Um, any last point? Just be very brief and then we'll go out to the floor. Well, I, I'm struck by the uh, uh, agreement between uh, Douglas and Cato on one point at least. They, they want to rerun the old discussions of the past about social, what socialism was like and what the Soviet Union represented. And we could do that. There is a case to have those kind of discussions. But I think it's more useful to try and talk about what's happening now, what is specific about today, and how that dif differs from historical experience. I would say we live in very different times uh, from uh, the past that's uh, being talked about. Yeah, I just want to clarify that the failures of socialism do not justify the failures of, you know, the, the, does not justify capitalism. So thinking in this dichotomy, uh, whether the choice is capitalism or socialism is exactly the wrong way to go. There was a very interesting study uh, by Harvard University of uh, the uh, political opinions of millennials and they, um, most of the millennials, they reject capitalism and socialism. So this is great that we're looking for an alternative to capitalism and we don't need to um, be trapped in this, in this choice, capitalism or socialism. Thank you. And Johnny, did you want to make any point or save it for the, save it for the floor? Right. OK, let's go out to the floor. My name is Patrick. I just want to make a few comments and pick up some of the threads. So first of all, congratulations, Kate. I think your, 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 uh, your points are very well taken. I, I think um, the historical record is 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 clear to me as well. I mean, in terms of capitalism as a prosperity engine and showing this over and over again, and uh, in terms of the socialisms, um, it seems to me like Douglas said it. That the youth, the huge flaw here is you have these rather negatively focused theories, and on the constructive side, there's very little, and then the discovery of uh, illusions collapsing. Um, body count was mentioned. And I think if you look back at the world wars and particularly Second World War, etc., uh, I would attribute this to the um, ideologies of socialism taking root uh, through, now I say something, that there's a strong proximity between fascism and socialism in terms of state taking control. Uh, and there have been a lot of comparisons on the side of totalitarianism, and, and I believe into this, the fascist party of Italy was a faction of Socialist Party of Italy and National Socialism, that has been always denied and there's a very artificial thinking in terms of left-right. And I think when Johnny at the end says the right is turning kind of away from markets, that's, that's why these notions are false. Uh, I've become, I've kind of switched, I've been radicalized through the 2008 uh, crisis in the direction of free market capitalism, in the direction of um, um, libertarianism, uh, away from um, um, and, and I have been a Marxist at one time as well. So I wanted to just, my question I want to direct to, to Daniel because it's very unclear to me. I mean, I like your discourse of agency and I think that agency shouldn't be working class agency, should be every stratum and individual agency as well and, and, and flourishing. Where would you stand? Uh, would you defend this kind of older socialism? You said socialism uh, is dead in the sense that this isn't there, the new socialists aren't any, but where do you stand? 
can I read into your pro-capitalism? Because otherwise there would be only one figure on this panel who has a kind of pro-capitalist position and rejects all these socialist delusions, which I am fully with you, but I want to know where Daniel stands. I see it the opposite way. There's only one socialist on the panel, and they're all... <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the question at the back, um, and then we will go... I am the true socialist. <laughs> uh, just OK. <clears throat> Sorry, it's something for the panel to come back on. I sort of did my growing up uh, from a teenager into an adult in the 1980s, and I definitely saw myself as a socialist, and the big defining issues... Um, with the miners' strike, the Portman's War, and then so-called Thatcherism. One thing I really noticed, reflecting back on the 1980s, was progressively, as Margaret Thatcher won election after, after election, all the people I knew who were socialists started to blame the working class. Why did they vote for this woman? Why didn't they vote for our version of, of socialism? Why did they want to buy their council houses? Uh, and all the rest of it, and, and that really changed. It seems to me that in the back of the 80s, a lot of socialists, people saw themselves as socialists, they looked away from the working class, they looked to Europe, they want Europe to protect workers' rights, and we see that still today. They looked to NGOs, uh, unelected, undemocratic organisations that may do good in some areas, and they looked to social movements which have become very identitarian and quite divisive in terms of working class politics. And I think when people talk about socialism today, I think what seems to be left, it draws on all of those things, as has been said, technocratic, often identitarian, and a kind of moral identity that puts you up here for the people who celebrate it, and kind of puts you on a morally higher plane to other people with the right to know platform them, platform them and things like that. And I think we need to talk about, I think there was, some, there was a certain humanism in, 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 in socialist ideas in the past. That's gone, and that's why I wouldn't call myself a socialist at all today. Thank you. Um, I would quickly like to challenge Kate's idea. For a start, um, the Black Book of Communism, 100 million deaths, I think we could probably all agree that's borderline on rubbish. Because it's pretty, isn't it significantly just widely agreed that those numbers were vastly exaggerated? Now, I'm not defending communist Russia, but what I am saying is that when I look at communities like anarchist Catalonia, anarchist Ukraine, socialist Cuba, socialist Burkina Faso, I don't see failures, I see brief successes that were crushed by the tyranny of capitalism, right? Um, and is this movement away from, so, so capitalism is a dominant ideology in the world, we can all agree on that. So can we not attribute the current deaths that, that as, as I mentioned earlier, the body count of capitalism is still very, very high. I mean, five, people, five million people die of poverty related causes, preventable causes every single year in the world. And can we, not, can we not blame capitalism on its lack of competence in distributing the, the resources that we clearly have to prevent these deaths nowadays? So the body count question, while I would never defend atrocities committed by communist, you know, um, authoritarian communist states, should we not also be questioning the fact that capitalism clearly has failed? And as millennials, we're looking for an, an alternative to this clear oppression of human nature. I feel like this panel has been quite... Uh, Eurocentric in the sense that capitalism actually takes many forms. It's not capitalism, capitalism, um, capitalism of Europe is very different to capitalism in Mongolia in the rising capitalism countries in the Caribbean. And we're not really looking at how they actually take capitalism. It's quite different to how we do it. And quite often they do take into quite the human side of capitalism quite well. But also on the other side, socialism actually rise up very, very early because I study archaeology myself. Um, Marshall Salen's idea of the original um, affluent society. So the original societies were in some way a communal society and that has has a very very long history, longer than capitalism is, because money doesn't come in that far along the human, you know, homo sapien line. It's quite a new thing. But also quite a lot of old societies, they have this idea of mixing socialism with capitalism so there's part of the year where people come together and there's chief and there's a very clear hierarchy and it is capitalist, people trade, people have money. But then half of the year people go away and they turn into community, like com communism pretty much, society. And there's no chief, everyone's equal. And that society worked quite well. People in that time, we have evidence in archaeology that they used to work a lot less, stress a lot less, and they seem to be living relatively happy life. They're not as long because medicine but also they work maybe two hours a day whereas we work nine to five every day so do you think it's 
plausible in modern society that we have a mixture of different kinds of capitalism with different kinds of socialism and we could find a negotiating point that you could agree from both sides. I feel sure that I'm a socialist in the same way that um, Kate is. And plainly we all are because here we are um, dissatisfied with private interest, uh, debating uh, public action, debating policy. Um, uh, plainly, if we believe that um, only uh, self-interest um, uh, uh, was the avenue uh, through which uh, uh, we could attain anything, we wouldn't know uh, there would be no public debate, there would be no argument, there would be no contestation. There wouldn't be the kind of morbid symptoms that we see. Uh, and I don't want to underline them because they're many and they're kind of grotesque and it's a cheap argument. Uh, but, you know, I'm a, also a capitalist in the same way that, um, you know, Douglas is, that in that, um, you know, everybody understands that um, uh, uh, private interest is indeed a, you know, motor force of, of um, uh, great creativity and uh, productivity. And I think anybody who tries to say that um, the modern world is inefficient um, uh, more than the, the world it displaced is just misunderstanding what's taking place. We've seen a tremendous... Um, uh, explosion of um, uh, uh, productivity and the productivity of labour. Um, and what we're all, I guess, trying to argue about is uh, how do we make that into something that's working for people rather than something that's undermining their day-to-day um, uh, -day existence and the possibilities of their, um, uh, uh, their flourishing and their, their human uh, interaction. Do, do the labels matter that much? I'm not so sure, but you know, both things must be true. One is that we've achieved as a race, a species, a tremendous amount. Uh, and the other, that it's plainly uh, unsatisfactory, uh, that our mode of social organization is plainly unsatisfactory because we keep saying so. Thank you very much. Um, and so the panelists, um, Albella? You. Yes, uh, Patrick, uh, you said your know, capitalism uh, creates prosperity. This is this is a big myth of capitalism. It is science and human work that create prosperity, and those two can be organized in many ways. They don't have to be um, given to the pursuit of profit. Because what capitalism does is it, rather than satisfy needs, it creates needs which it then satisfies. So there's always this inflation of needs that we need to work towards uh, satisfaction. So this is what, what needs to stop, um, as well as the, the myth that capitalism creates prosperity. Uh, about the mix, very interesting remark about the mix of socialism and capitalism. I think you're indeed um, thinking in the right direction in very pragmatic ways of, of organizing societies to the societies to, to procuring good lives without the trap of working more than we need in order to you know, create those commodities that we need to keep selling. Right, so the, the way to achieve this is not to think about in which direction we want to go, you know, capitalism, socialism, but what dynamics of capitalism we need to oppose. So what I'm proposing is we need to oppose the competitive production of profit, the com competition, productivity, productive nature of human labor and profit, pursuit of profit. If we focus on elimination of those three, we'll end up on some sort of post-capitalist society, we don't need to have a label for it. Um, we did not arrive at capitalism because somebody coined the word capitalism and there was a, a project of, of, of building capitalism. So we can get rid of capitalism without any labels. Thank you, Albert. Um Daniel? Yeah, well, another one of my key points was going to be that if you look at what characterized socialism historically, uh, it was the idea that there was an alternative to the market. They wanted to get rid of the market and have a socialist society. That was, you know, that was a defining character. And some, some thought you, could, you had to do it by revolutionary means. Some thought you did it by slow, gradual means. But the idea was replace capitalism with socialism, which wasn't about the market, which was a different kind of social system. Now, pretty much everyone worldwide, not just in Britain, believes in capitalism. Or that at least they believe there's no alternative to the market. That is historically a huge difference. And when people criticize capitalism today, they criticize it for the wrong reasons. Their criticism is that capitalism is too dynamic. It produces too much, which to my mind is completely the wrong criticism. You know, I might criticize capitalism today, I would do, for not being dynamic enough in some instances, not producing enough. But that's not the mainstream criticism. The mainstream criticism is it produces too much. 
and it puts the planet at risk. So that's the kind of critique that's being put forward. Again, 180 degrees from where we were historically. In terms of what I believe in, I realise perhaps I've been a bit morbid uh, until this point, but what I think is really positive and what hasn't been uh, mentioned until now is the fact that you've had Brexit and you ha you have, you've got a populist revolt against the technocracy of the European Union and technocratic governments across Europe. And although, you know, th those the populist parties are not perfect, that is something very, very positive. And I think we should discuss that a lot more, work out how to orientate ourselves towards that, rather than talk about exactly how many people did the Soviet Union kill and did, you know, all those kind of debates are not very useful, I would say, to have. Thank, Thank you. Um, Johnny? Yeah, um... Sorry, Daniel, I'm going to take issue with something you said in your opener now. <laughs> but it kind of relates to a few of the people's comments from the audience as well. Um, about how, um, I think the gentleman at the back said the left, uh, the left sort of capitulated in the 80s to the sort of, to, to market dogma and uh, became more interested in sort of um, women's lib, um, BME struggles, uh, gay rights, that kind of thing, to the detriment of class politics. I think um, there, there was a time when the left didn't talk about class. I mean, Margaret Thatcher said that her greatest achievement was Tony Blair. Um, because the Labour Party and the left um, sort of disappeared off that scene and accepted um, the sort of capitalist realism of the situation they were in. Now that has been completely called into question um, because of 2008 and various other things. James mentioned productivity. Um, absolutely productivity. I mean, we have, we have the worst product productivity in the OECD, I believe, I think, or, or, or in Europe or something. Or the worst, sorry, yeah, the worst rate of growth. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, as I saw a stat the other day that at the, the bottom third or two thirds of American workers, despite the rise in productivity since the 70s, haven't seen uh, any real wage growth whatsoever since the mid 70s. I can't remember if it was the bottom third or the bottom half, but it was, it was basically the, low, the lower end of the American working class. Um, I wish I had this stat with me. But despite the growth in productivity that capitalism has brought in that whole period since the 1970s, um, basically, the, the, the benefits of that growth haven't been distributed properly or, or evenly. Basically, the wealth has been concentrated at the top to such an extent. Um, and someone mentioned that, you know, the 99 percent, 1 percent thing isn't useful. But, you know, the, 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 the data does show that a huge amount of this wealth has been concentrated with the 1 percent and 1 percent of the 1 percent. You know, the, the, the gains of the gains of growth have not been distributed properly. And that's why we're seeing a revolt. And that's why we saw things like Brexit. Um, your criticism of the late Corbyn's Brexit position, I think, was completely justified. <laughs> and for all I'll defend Corbyn, um, I certainly won't defend um, Labour's Brexit policy. Um, I voted leave and I believe that the left did make a mistake um, after, you know, after the appeals, the laws um, sort of period to sort of move towards um, seeing Europe as a social Europe. I think it is a um, unjustifiable technocracy. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Johnny. Uh, Kate? Um, sure, actually, just very quickly to, to Daniel, I basically agree with everything you're saying. Um, the reason I think that we do need to take the past into account is because I don't think it's a new aspect of socialist rhetoric that there's deep hypocrisy in it. Um, I don't think that's that's relatively new. You know, Jeremy Corbyn going on TV basically calling for maximum wages and then the presenter saying, well, what would it be? Would it be your wage? And he was like, no, 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 it wouldn't be my wage. It'd be people who earn more than me. Um, is is not a new phenomenon of, of socialism. It always ends with people at the top securing all the money and the power. There are always resources. There's always money. There's always power. It's just that, you know, that, that class of technocrats wants it. So I think it is helpful to look back previously. I think there are links. Um, to the gentleman in the front row, as I said, the, the conservative estimates are about 20 million. The higher end estimates are about 100 million. So for the purpose of this chat, let's let's meet in the middle. Let's say it's let's say it's 60 million, 60 million deaths. And 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 the problem, of course, is that we're not just talking about the Soviet Union. We're talking about China. We're talking about Cuba. We're talking about Venezuela. We're talking about East Germany. We're talking about the countless number of examples where people's lives have been lost to this ideology. And I think you raise some 
really interesting points about, you know, why is it that in an age of such prosperity, we can't get more resources um, and more investment in regions that don't have as much? Um, and, you know, I think that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate point. And, and I would say that what always baffles me about sort of the far left socialism perspective is that it's not putting one and one together to make two that you can redistribute more if you bring in the income to do so. So now in the UK alone, about 25% of public expenditure goes on what we would consider to be welfare projects, education, healthcare free at the point of use, benefits, housing benefits, the rest of it. You know, 25%, you know, decades ago, that wouldn't have been anywhere near possible anywhere near possible. It is because we are raising more through tax revenue. It's because people are more productive, getting richer, paying higher taxes, that you can have these better public services. And again, you know, we can debate how high the tax rate should be. You know, I might want them slightly lower, someone on the left might want them slightly higher, but we have to recognize that it's free market enterprise that raises that money to redistribute, not just domestically, but also worldwide. The innovations that are making it possible for women, for, you know, women in Nigeria to access online banking to protect their money to actually earn something for themselves comes from free market pursuits and capitalism. Penicillin, medicine, all of it going around the world, getting cheaper, becoming more accessible comes from the market. Should we aim to do better? Always let's aim to do better. But let's not kill the, the you know, the primary examples um, of, of economic philosophy and also economic practice, which have spread this prosperity so quickly around the world. Um, and the last thing I would just quickly say is, is, you know, the panel keeps talking about how we need to reorganize, how, you know, you know, it's science, it's human ingenuity, it's, it's our productivity that we need to reorganize. So it's for, let, let, let's be honest about what this word organize means. It means control. It does, when you talk about reorganizing, you're talking about bringing in a top-down approach to control and structure how people live their lives and what they do. And that is a very, very dangerous ideology. And that is why socialism continues to end in failure, because it tries to take the natural, liberal, autonomous aspects of the market where people trade freely and use their capital as they see fit, and somebody else from the top tries to control it. And that's where it goes so terribly wrong. And sorry, very lastly, to that gentleman at the top who said why he he isn't a socialist anymore because it's not based on workers' rights anymore. And I'm sure you'll probably disagree with me on plenty. But um, I think what I think what one of the reasons that the working class came around to people like Margaret Thatcher is because she made it possible for them to buy their homes. She made it possible for them to profit, to own something. And when we attack profit in and of itself, what we're actually saying usually to people who are a bit poor or working class or haven't done as well for themselves is you shouldn't have the right to do better for yourself. And actually, I think that's one of the major reasons people came around. Thanks, Kate. And uh, Douglas? First off, just the, the last thing you said there, I'm not sure... I've heard that, you know, working class people, by and large, didn't support Margaret Thatcher. That's her support coming from other classes. But um, I feel really uh, stuck because I'm, I'm not sharing many of the assumptions of other people on the panel. And I'm a Star Trek fan. And there's, in every Star Trek episode, there's a moment where one of the characters will say, oh, all we have to do is reverse the polarity of the neutron flow and uh, put out a graviton beam and... And then everything will be fixed. And so I'm stuck to, I'm that guy. Um, uh, because what I want to talk about is not um, what we've been talking about. I want to talk about how capital actually is formed and what the, techn the technicalities of it are. And the, the thing about capitalism is it's not a matter of political power alone. It's not an ideology alone. So if you think of it in terms of an ideology or political form, you can think that there are multiple kinds of capitalism. Um, but if you understand what capitalism is, capital is the accrual of c consumer goods which have value based, and not just consumer goods, but all commodities, which have value based on the amount of time spent working to produce them. Okay? And so what that means is that it, you have to have a class of people who um, have nothing to sell but their labor in order for capitalism to, to exist. Now, up until now, capitalism has also been an incredibly progressive force in society. I don't think any can, anyone can really deny that. The fact that we uh, have gay marriage now, for instance, I think can, can be attributed most of all to the way capitalism rearranges our social relations based on innovation and in, in, uh, 
the technology of production and who and how it needs to organize people to produce more and different kinds of goods. But the problem is that it also requires uh, uh, people to spend more and more time working faster and faster in such a way that the commodities that they produce, it's like, well, okay, it's really easy. They reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. But what I mean is it's, it, it goes against itself. Um, the value of the commodities diminish even as we produce them faster. So we live in a society full of wealth, but uh, without enough value. But, so that we can be poor, we can be homeless, and we can be surrounded by wealth. And it's not a matter only of the capitalist class against the working class. It's a matter of the totality of the system. So what I'm saying is not that we need to create a, a new uh, government that can control this apparatus, but that we need to create a new apparatus. Now, how we do that is, frankly, beyond me. I, we'd have to, we have to organize. We have to think hard. We have to have more conversations like these. Um, but uh, that's all I, I guess I want to say. Is, and if anyone is under, understanding me, power to you. <laughs> uh, so we'll go out to the floor. Thanks, uh, Douglas. It's uh, nice to know there's another Trekkie here. And in fact, actually, there's a good book on uh, sort of socialism in, in Star Trek called Treconomics, which I'd all recommend you try and read about the economics of Star Trek and also the kind of very popular space communism, as it's sort of referred to today. So just thought I'd make that point. Right. Um, let's go the lady there first. Um, I don't want to sidetrack the discussion, but I really can't hear, listen anymore to Kate talking about how many people are being killed in the name of socialism. Um, think about the countless intervention, Western interventions that have happened over the last 50 years at least that have been Western orientated and that have really been very harmful to other societies, right? Let's not forget Vietnam and two world wars, break up the Soviet of, of, of uh, Yugoslavia. You can go on and on and on. So please, you know, I don't think we should be trading how many people have died in the name of any particular ideology. Um, I just want to say something about the emptiness of the term uh, socialism. And it, it's something that hadn't really been apparent to me for a long time. I mean, about 10 years ago, I remember talking to, you know, members of my family and, you know, we we're sitting around the dinner table and someone says, oh, you know, we're all socialists, aren't we? And I kind of nod along. And yeah, that's nice. Um, and, and I realized how kind of meaningless that, that was, you know, only nowadays when you're hearing again and again, um, this was at a time when people weren't calling themselves socialists. So I, I felt quite radical about that. And, you know, having family members saying that. But now when you hear the, you know, Elizabeth Warrens of this world or, you know, the, the Corbyn supporters or, you know, calling themselves socialists and, you know, and then, and then you dig down to their ideas, you know, what are they? They're just basically bureaucracy, technocracy, um, you know, the climate change stuff is, is really interesting. The Green New Deal, you know, the whole um, that, that people are kind of grappling with these kind of old terms, possibly in the absence of um, anything else um, more than anything. And what what worries me is that there is, you know, as, as Daniel alluded to, you know, there's Brexit, there's these populist revolts. But where, where are the new big ideas that are going to, um, you know, meet people's needs? How are we going to? Um, Kate doesn't like the word reorganize, but you know, organization has to be kept in check as well. The current order of things has to be um, <laughs> kept in through um, fair means or foul. Um, how, how are we going to reorganize society to make things for the better? And I, and I don't see any ideas coming from the left or, or the right on, on that front, I'm afraid. And that's the most disappointing thing. First of all, I was maybe a bit surprised by the gentleman in front of me that who turned to capitalism after the crisis in 2008, which I don't understand the logic behind because the crisis of 2008 was a production of capitalism. Um, and then going maybe to the point of productivity as a criticism, um, where you said that socialists just um, complain about the productivity of capitalism. Um, but I disagree that anybody can uh, challenge that capitalism is productive. I mean, that's the point of capitalism. But the point is that it is the sole purpose of capitalism, that people, um, environment, um, are suffering because of that productivity. And concerning climate change, um, I think we were talking a lot about uh, body count. And I think nobody denies that capitalism is the cause of climate change. 
that climate change will, if we don't stop capitalism and the machinery we are in, will have the biggest body count we have ever imagined. And I mean, I don't want to talk about the past. I think that's just intellectually boring to think as socialism or capitalism. And I think we have to think about new ways of how we challenge, because we have this big, gigantic challenge of climate change. So I wanted to um, finish my question to uh, Albena and ask you were talking about um, a way to get to a point where we have um, a utopia without saying utopia and uh, without having a revolution, but how should we get there and mm -hmm. what would be the pathway to get there? Thank you. So I have a question, but first I have a comment uh, that I wanted to make to Daniel. You seem to me to make a pretty egregious conflation between capitalism and the market, saying that uh, the Soviet socialists tried to abolish the market. And what, they didn't do that. They never tried to do that. What they tried to do is uh, abolish the profit motive in the market. You know, markets have existed under feudalism, under socialism, they exist everywhere. They're not, a, 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 they're an integral part of capitalism, but they're not sufficient, right? Um, my question is about uh, universal basic income. Um, it seems like there's a, a, a revitalized support. And a, the simple question is, is this socialist or is this capitalist? The, um, uh, just to finish with, with the popularity of Andrew Yang in the United States, seemed that the way that he sells it to the American people is that this is a deeply capitalist idea. And I wanted to hear from you. Do you agree? Is this capitalist or is this socialist? Thank you. Daniel started his uh, initial talk with a quite a shocking comment that socialism is dead and it's not making a comeback. But I, I, I think I would agree with that largely. But I would like to add that I, th I think that capitalism, in a sense, is also dead, uh, which sounds like a strange thing to say, seeing as we're clearly living in capitalism and capitalism is not going to magically transform into anything else. So we don't have any alternative. But as, a, as a, an ideology, as, a, as an, an inspiring set of ideas, uh, I think capitalism is probably just as dead as socialism is. And it is in that context, I think, that we have to understand this apparent resurrection of interest in socialism, which to me appears to have, um, have bloomed on the social media, and it appears to have been resurrected more by the right, in fact, the, the, the social media alt-right, who started um, to um, uh, sort of take to, uh, very strange ways as well to sort of t to, to take up a fight against Stalin and Mao and and all of these sort of dead characters from history um, and this in some sense seems to have inspired other people to say hey hang on a bit if this sounds um, still around let's look into it and then we st seem to end up with a, a form of socialism which seemed to take the exact opposite features so on the one hand, you've got the right talking about the, the, um, the gulags and Stalin, and, and then you've got the sort of newly resurrected socialists, democratic socialists of America, for instance, who are so sort of inclusive that at their recent conference, they didn't have any applause because it might upset the handful of uh, uh, autistic people in the audience. Um, at one point, someone complained that, that um, guys, guys, he said, some people are talking and some of us feel really nervous if there's any sounds uh, in the background. Whereupon someone else complained, you can't use the word guys because that is upsetting to, to women and non-binary non type of people. Um, <clears throat> which sounds as far away well, both versions of socialism are, are far away from each other. But I think you can say one thing to Stalin is that he would not have got upset about people applauding him. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to ask the panel um, a question about the, uh, the, the, the flourishing of the so socialism that's in the brochure. You know, what is perceived as going on in the Democratic Party in America and what's perceived to be going on in, in, in the Labour Party in this country. I um, won't go broader than that, but... Uh, because to me, there's an intriguing mismatch between this perception that socialism is on the rise, that we're, we're told to worry about, you know, a Marxist in number 10, possibly if Corbyn's got elected, about 
what's happening in, in the Democratic Party that the socialists and the left-wingers have taken over. It seems to be a mismatch between that perception, which isn't just from the right, it's from the center of politics, it's also from the far left of politics who got very excited that they think socialism has returned. The contrast between that and actually looking at what these movements represent, uh, not, not in terms of what their support is, but in terms of what they're actually saying. Because looking both at the Labour Party uh, manifesto, not the one that's still to come, but you know maybe that'll be a, a few different words, but looking at what's being said in, a, in the, the Socialist Party and the Democrats in America, there isn't any coherent program of any uh, sort there. It's a mishmash of, taken, of different ideas taken and sort of all put together. You've got a bit of green politics, a bit of Green New Deal, a bit of corporatism, a bit of nationalize this, a bit of a higher taxation here, a bit of industrial policy there. It's really a mishmash which could be taken from really anybody else's political parties. And they, people who call themselves socialists, fine, they can call themselves what they want. But it's the mismatch between that and then everybody else in society seemingly getting carried away with it and think this is real, true Marxist socialism. So I'd be interested in views of that, that disconnect between what they're actually saying and promising with the way we seem to be getting so excited about it. I may be bringing the conversation back almost an hour at this point. Um, but just going back to the original question of this, uh, this panel, um, is socialism making a comeback? I may just be speaking for myself here, but it doesn't sound, I haven't actually heard an actual definition of socialism yet. I've heard, Kate I think is the only one who got even close to a definition. I haven't heard what is socialism from, any, from anyone else. Um, how does it differentiate from communism, social democracy, capitalism, things like that? Because it, what it really sounds like to me right now is we're sort of bouncing around different points with no one actually agreeing on even the fundamental uh, language that we're using. Hi, yeah, I'd just like to echo kind of that guy's point, really. There doesn't seem to be many clear definitions of what socialism is and isn't. And a lot of people are talking about kind of different models and kind of Scandinavian models. And we're talking about the kind of pitfalls of capitalism, which do exist. But it seems to me that we, we, we for a long time, live in what is, a, is in effect a social democracy and is, is, and is, a, is a blend of both anyway. So, so people kind of can point towards capitalism, but, but you know, the, the, the faults don't necessarily like lay just with capitalism in that regard. Um, finally, I'd just like to kind of just say uh, one thing, under the current system in the UK, you're relatively free as it is to organize yourself in, and organize labor. You can set up a cooperative. I should know, I've, I've, I've worked for one, it failed. You, you're relatively free, if you want, at the moment, to grow your own food, to, to weave your own clothes. Thank you. Uh, thanks for all those uh, questions and points from the floor. We will try and get back out again, but um, uh, Johnny, would you like to respond first? I, I completely agree with you, man up here, that you know, we all have um, completely different ideas of what socialism are. Mine probably correspond more with Douglas's, I guess, than anyone else's. I mean, I think I said at the beginning, he asked 100 different people, you get 100 different definitions. Um, I mean, Co Corbynism, Corbynism isn't... I, I, I mean, that's, that 2017 manifesto, the Labour manifesto, is probably slightly to the right of, of Ted Heath, you know? That, that's a sign of how far politics shifted since the 1970s. The, the Conservatives had nationalised BT, nationalized British Airways, water, gas, electricity. Um, they were building millions of council houses, uh, very strong relationships with trade unions. Um, this, this was far, far, far to the left of what Corbyn was proposing uh, in 2017, which to my mind was um, quite a, a mild version of, of sort of Scandi style social democracy. The, I, I would love things to go much further. <laughs> I would love things to be fully red-blooded, you know, storm the house, storm the houses of parliament, um, and string the bastards up type socialism. But <laughs> oh, Kate's going to get me now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, having been part of those movements uh, from a relatively young age and gone to the weirdest um, and oddest sort of crevices of the far left sectarian group group of schools i've decided that that's not going to happen any time soon <laughs> but what might happen is we might have a labor victory at some stage and we might have a government that you know builds council houses and raises the minimum wage and gets a slightly more equitable equitable distribution um of the wealth that society creates um 
that that that's far from perfect, of course. Um, but to my mind, it's the it's 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 a step in the right direction. I'm sure Douglas would agree that um, you know Sanders, Corbyn, they're not they're not necessarily the real deal. But you know, I, I give him my full critical support. <laughs> Something Kate said earlier about um, the working class is supporting Thatcher because she because of right to buy. Yeah, undoubtedly true. Um, but what right to buy has led to 40 years down the line is an entire generation of people, none of whom can afford um, any kind of houses. And there aren't any council houses for them and they can't afford to buy and private rents are pushing them out of the big cities um, and places where the jobs are um, because the market has been left to its own devices, essentially. And um, Perhaps I would suggest that that's the reason why so many millennials and so many young people are moving towards people like Corbyn and Sanders, because um, to their mind, the market has failed. It, wages are stagnating, rents are going through the roof, and um, they can't expect to have the same sort of livelihoods that, that their parents had. Um, and, you know, they, they don't see a future in the way things are. Yeah, I think that's about it. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, Douglas? Um, okay, I'll take a stab at um, defining socialism. Uh, this is my own uh, eccentric definition of socialism, but it's based on Marx, and my understanding of Marx. Socialism is the political or economic system wherein the international community, the masses, the workers, can shape the terms of their own relations, uh, that is, uh, the economic and political and institutional relations, both as individuals and collectively. That that is it's where people are responsible for the terms of their life and they know it so they can change those terms um, so that, that's my definition I don't know that's think about that one the, uh, the other thing I want to say is that just to answer the question for the panel that was proposed to the panel at the beginning which is is socialism having a comeback what I would say the real answer is is that neoliberalism is crashing and burning and uh, whenever capitalism goes into a, a ideological and political crisis, there's an opportunity for some sort of socialist transcendence to happen, but it's not at all guaranteed. And we're sort of in this period where uh, cap capitalism or the politics, political classes of the capitalist order are trying to figure out a new way forward. And it does look like a mishmash at the moment. Um, I think that's supporting people like Corbyn and Sanders is a good bet, but I do know that something more radical than that has to happen if we're gonna get out from under this sort of system of, of perpetual crisis and, and disorder. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, Daniel? Well, first of all, history. I, I think it's very important to discuss history and have uh, a knowledge of history, but in relation to this discussion, is socialism making a comeback? That is the title of the discussion. I think it can be an evasion. That's why it's critical of the discussion of history uh, in this discussion. Uh, in terms of a definition, I didn't give a one-line definition, but I think I did outline what I saw as, whether you agree with me or not, different characteristics of what socialism meant historically. So it was about working class agency. It was about increasing working class living standards. Uh, it was about some notion of economic progress, working class control. So there were elements that were core to uh, different types of socialism historically, and that's not what we have now. Uh, so that does kind of pose a conundrum of why we have people like Corbyn uh, coming to the fore in the UK or uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, in the US. But I, I think one interesting thing about them is they're not, their social base is not socialist. You know, if you look at the people who voted for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in her New York congressional district, you know, it's basically the kind of hipster vote of those kind of people. It's not. Generally speaking, it's not the working class who are supporting these people. They have a very different social base, usually kind of relatively well-off, uh, public sector kind of people. Uh, and it's very easy for them to use the language of socialism. Because historically, when you had a real socialist movement that threatened capitalism, uh, those kind of people would be terrified of using the language of socialism. Uh, whereas now, it's very easy for them to do it. So it sounds very radical and uh, humanistic, but in fact, it's the opposite. Uh, and finally, in relation to the point about uh, the environment and the, the climate crisis, I'm actually speaking about that at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. There's a debate on the Green New Deal. But I take completely the opposite view. I mean, I think historically, 
uh, the left was very anti-green because they saw the they saw the greens quite rightly as being opposed to working class living standards, opposed to economic progress. And I think I don't think we have a climate crisis. I think we have a problem with the climate. But I think, in fact, environmentalism, green thinking, is undermining our ability to tackle the problems rationally. And I think, in fact, what we need to do, we can discuss it more tomorrow. I can see you're shaking your head. That's fine. <laughs> uh, we can discuss it. We can discuss it more tomorrow. But I think raising productivity and having more technological innovation uh, will help us to solve the problem of climate change to the extent it's a problem, without getting it out of uh, out of context. Thank you. Can I interrupt? Sorry, if I, if I just, just very briefly. You know, just because you you, you wear skinny jeans and uh, it doesn't mean that you can't be a sort of precarious worker. The the old industrial sort of blue collar working class is gone. You don't have to wear a flat cap and have a whippet to be working class. You know, a lot of these people who ride bikes around uh, and read the Guardian, they might be on twenty grand a year in very precarious jobs, and they might be paying through the nose of some private landlord and have no prospect of owning anything in the, in their lives. Um, you know, so the, the boundaries of class have changed. But they're still cooler than you. Yeah. Say again, sorry? No, I was talking to Daniel. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's not difficult. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kate. Uh, yeah, sure. And on the point about the climate crisis as well, I think it speaks to the issue that we don't have a lot of new ideas circulating because it seems to be that the major narrative is that we need to roll things back. People need to fly less. They need to consume less meat. They need to consume less overall. And actually, again, that really feeds into an issue because um, usually the, the targeted measures to do that are higher taxes, which are regressive and hurt poor people the most. Um, so we need ideas to move things forward, not to move things back. Um, so glad someone brought up the universal basic income because this was actually an idea that um, I'm not sure if it fully originated, but one of one of the one of the great thinkers behind it was actually the free market economist Milton Friedman, who came up with the concept of a negative income tax, which pretty much feeds into the UBI. It's an idea that has support on the left and the right. I'm not totally bought into it yet because I, I worry that it would basically be used as a political football around every election season. Who's going to increase the UBI? But there is right wing support because it's freedom maximizing and nobody's telling you you have to live here. You have to buy that. So I find a very interesting idea. Um, to the woman who complained about me noting that socialism has killed millions of people, I'm sorry you don't like hearing the figures. I don't want to harp on it too much, but if we're going to have a debate about socialism and making a comeback, let's talk about what it's actually resulted in. To your point about foreign intervention, I think you'll find a lot of people of, of my persuasion agree with you. Um, you know, there are a lot of libertarians out there and free marketeers who think that a lot of the pursuits abroad by the US and the UK have been not just fruitless, but also resulted in, in, in some you know pretty horrific death tolls. So I don't think that's incompatible. Um, and the last thing I'd say about neoliberalism burning or coming to an end, I don't think it is. Um, you know, we're talking about young people, skinny jean wearing hipsters as, you know, new socialists, maybe they're working class, maybe they're not. They're also some of the biggest consumers. I mean, they are the reason that things like Uber and Airbnb and Deliveroo have taken off. They love the free market economy. They love choice more than anybody else. They hate being told what to do. I think they're really a bunch of budding libertarians. Where I do think that capitalism and, and, um, and neoliberalism, what it really needs to address is accountability. I think a lot of young people in particular care more about fairness, care more about transparency and the rest. And that's where I think things like free enterprise are really going to come into their own because young people also want to be entrepreneurs. They want to see people make things and they want them to be credited for it. So I'm actually relatively optimistic. I don't think we're moving into a socialist dystopia. I think uh, we actually may be uh, moving into a new era of free enterprise that's more accountable. Thank you, Kate. And Al Benner? Okay, one of the, you know, the biggest um, evils of socialism we hear uh, here is um, technocracy. However, technocracy is not uh, uh, the love child of, of um, socialism. It is uh, the result of, com of, of modernity and complexity. So all modern societies need technocracy. The, the thing is how that technocracy, what kind of policy it is used for. Um, China has a bureaucracy, a technocracy very heavy, so it is a capitalist technocracy. Um, I, I very much doubt that Brexit uh, was triggered by, by uh, frustrations with technocracy uh, of the EU, but rather with the kind of free market capitalist model that it has been pushing since the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, so the EU is a free market 
a capitalist entity that operates through a heavy technocracy indeed, and we should uh, criticize it for it. Now, a gentleman there said that um, uh, there is a policy, there's a poverty of ideas where to go, and we are really, uh, that is why we are rehashing these old ideas of socialism we have, this is what we have. Um, and then another person invited me to uh, say how we get there, how we fight capitalism. Uh, how lucky that I've written a book about that. It's coming out. <laughs> it's coming out in December. But let me just say something. Uh, the most urgent thing is to stop the competition with the likes of uh, China, because as long as we compete with with uh, with China, we will be emulating, we will be copying that successful model of technocratic, autocratic capitalism it has. We'll end up another China. So that well, that's the first thing to do, to reorganize, to reinvent globalization through very uh, in, inscribing uh, very high um, standards of labor protection and ecological protection. So uh, a different kind of globalization is the first thing to, 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 to start with. And I have many more suggestions. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you very much for coming. And I'd like to invite you all to um, give a round of applause for our panel.